Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Gardening on the Gulf Coast program. Today's roundtable will begin shortly. We thank you so much. We, we know that it's been a wonderful spring for you. And we'll be reviewing sev several topics, including a little bit about wildflowers. So y'all hang tight. We'll be starting in just a few more moments. Hey, good morning, Skip. Good morning. I just made an announcement introducing our program, so we'll be starting in just a few moments. Very good. Oh, do and you, I'm recording this. Do you feel like you have the privileges to run it that you need, Stephen? Uh, potentially. I've been able to start a recording for this program. All right, good. Thank you. Well, good morning, folks, and welcome to Gardening in the Gulf Coast. We've got a great program for you today. We have several horticulturists online that are available to provide a roundtable for you, answering questions that you might have about gardening, your gardening practices. Remember, you've got great skills. We're just helping you improve the skills that you already have. The host for the program today, uh, facilitator for our program, will be um, esteemed horticulturist Kevin Gibbs. Kevin's from down south, down around uh, Corpus Christi, Aransas County. I uh, really appreciate um, Kevin's um, expertise in, in keeping us all wrangled. Participating as well as uh, horticulturist David Oates. David is from over, uh, hey David, <laughs> over uh, a little bit east of us. Uh, Skip Richter from uh, Brazos County. He's in College Station. Yours truly, Stephen Bruggerhoff from Galveston County. And then uh, Kimberly Mayer is joining us from Brazoria County. So, Kevin, anytime you're ready, just kind of lead this discussion for us, sir. Oh, and go ahead and unmute yourself, Kevin. Yes, sir, that helps when you unmute yourself. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. We're happy that y'all are joining us today, and we're here to answer any questions that you guys might have. Uh, maybe we'll start with the topic this morning, since a lot of people are, are trying to get ready for spring. Uh, of what to do if you've still got freeze damage. Uh, let's see if anybody has questions or comments about um, what type of freeze damage we had and maybe some of the things that people are still encountering. So anyone, in, if you have questions, put them into the chat or raise your hand. Um, do any of our horticulturists want to talk about the types of freeze damage that you guys saw in your area? I'll jump in real quick just to keep things moving. Uh, I was surprised at the amount of damage from the December freeze, even compared to 
February of 21, where it got seven degrees in my area, uh, December caught our plants off guard and the extent of damage approaching some of the stuff we experienced in February of 21. Hey, I would like to add on that as well. Um, you know, down in my part of the world, the, the Golden Triangle here, Southeast Texas, uh, we did experience, and like Skip said, a lot of damage to our younger tender plants. And I'm talking those plants that were maybe two to three years old, maybe that were replaced after that uh, great freeze I think we had in 21. Uh, so we had a big rush to go out and put new citrus trees and things like that. Um, and a lot of those plants I don't think were hardy enough to uh, withstand such a cold freeze. Um, some of them are coming back again. Uh, again, some of them are not. So it's going to be kind of a wait and see attitude. And that's what I've been telling a lot of my folks is before you yank out the chainsaw or the, or the you know, saw to take them out and start over again, possibly for the second or third time, give those plants a little bit of extra time to wait and see um, if they are coming out and if they are going to be viable. Um, we've had a lot of cases where things that were grafted, uh, maybe the top didn't survive, but the rootstock did, uh, and we may not want to see that rootstock on certain things. So we just have to kind of wait and see and be very selective about what we want to take out at this point in time. Um, so that, that's my advice right now is, you know, very cautiously have a wait and see attitude on a lot of our plants, uh, especially our tropical uh, you know, fruit trees and things like that. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. You know, if you know that it's dead um, and it, it's not showing any growth, you can probably take it out. But if it's kind of lingering, I'm going to say just wait and see just a little bit before we start, you know, making some executive decisions on taking it out. So that, that's what we're seeing here um, on our uh, here in Southeast Texas, but uh, probably the same across the board. But uh, if somebody else is seeing something different, uh, let us know. Like I said, we can kind of go from there. I'm going to add a little bit to that, David. Um, with with not this freeze, but with winter storm Uri, uh, in many cases, it was almost a year before some of our plants came back up from the root system. So um, I I think you nailed it right on the head. Uh, don't be in any big rush. And the, the saving grace for all of us along the Gulf Coast is that very rarely do our soil temperatures go below freezing. So um, as long as the root system survive and it's not frozen below a graft or if it's a grafted plant, uh, usually you're going to get something coming back up. So, um, an example of that were our Indian carnations. Uh, I was pretty convinced that we were going to have to pull them out. They were about six to eight feet tall. Pretty convinced we were going to have to pull them out. We did have to prune them to the ground, uh, but almost a year after that freeze, uh, they began to come back up from the root system. So it, it's pretty incredible the things that uh, that occurred. Um, Michael Potter, do you have anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I've actually uh, just uh, saw an oak tree yesterday that had some damage. Uh, after that big freeze of Uri, we had, you know, kind of like almost a poodle effect on some of the branch work on some of the oak trees where they just mass produced, <laughs> I like to call it the poodle effect, but um, like mass produced uh, young growth along the branch, uh, along the main branch and not really on the um, the smaller branch work. So I saw some yesterday that was that was affected and kind of looked the same way and also saw some damage on some St. Augustine ones um, where we had the yellowing and stuff. You know, sometimes it can be confused with um, uh, early season take all root rot. But uh, this was, you know, very you know, had much of a pattern and was just kind of clear throughout the whole yard, kind of on a uh, on a sloped area. So, it, it, you know, kind of yellowed out, looked at some samples and there was no take all present. So it was. Um, very much just you know part of the process of uh, freeze damage got a couple of questions in chat um yeah um yeah, some of y'all may feel different you know we we've kind of left that poodle effect alone just kind of let that tree regrow maybe it'll it'll you know start to kind of i guess you know renormalize as far as its growth uh that's what we've seen for most part but if it you know if it starts to go on the decline then i would recommend you know cutting it off hey michael can i add to that uh yeah. exactly what you've seen and that's a good description is the poodle effect well we're seeing a lot of growth on the interior and we're i'm talking about fruit trees specifically real quick yeah. um you know maybe some citrus trees uh we see a lot of new growth on the interior of that tree 
and you have what I call the ice cream shell effect, where it's the outer one third layer uh, of that, uh, you know, tips on, down inside those plants down to about 12, 18 inches. Um, what's your thought on, on pruning that? Uh, you know, if we know that the tips are not coming back, can we do some pruning? And I, I call it cosmetic pruning to to prune that back. Do you want yeah. to prune out some of that dead material or would yeah. you kind of hold off a little bit longer? Yeah, any dead wood you want to go ahead and trim back, you know, about an inch or two behind it uh, just to kind of, and then of course shape the tree as it goes along. We kind of have a reset that occurs, you know, after we, we get a lot of damage, we kind of have to retrain the trees or retrain the plants to kind of get back to their normal forms. So uh, it's a good time to do that. Just, you know, especially with citrus trees and things like that, just to expect the fact that, you know, you may not do have much production because of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that I saw in my area, again, maybe I'm a little bit more southeast of you guys and probably a little bit north as well. Uh, the further north you got, we saw some damage, like you mentioned, to our shade trees. Uh, we had several trees, you know, that I don't think were very happy with the freeze weather. Um, and if it wasn't the freeze, then maybe the ice. We had several calls on some ice damage, uh, limbs snapping and things like that. Um, in my area, particularly, and probably yours as well, pine trees. Um, I had quite a few pine trees take a hit where basically two-thirds of the limbs and maybe the top snapped out just from the weight. Um, and so we've had to go in there and do some corrective pruning on some of the pine trees. Um, again, I, I always approach it from, let's look at it, you know, if we can prune it out and go from that direction. Um, and again, you have to look at the aesthetics of it. Um, yeah, you guys tell me, and, and this is what we've been telling our folks is to on some pruning. Um, obviously, you know, you don't want to do a what I call a buzz cut or a flat top. Um, and we, we see that a lot of times in pruning. Um, and again, if I'm pruning a, a shade tree, it's going to be more for aesthetics. And I always tell people if you have to prune it to take out dead wood, uh, it's best to do that earlier in the year uh, to avoid the heat stress of the summer coming on. Um, so we, we've seen that, especially on some of our, you know, shade trees. But uh, when you have damage to a pine tree from ice and, and wind and things like that, um, that's a little bit different since it's a, a single trunk tree. Um, just depending on the species, sometimes we will recommend a, a complete removal if it's just a stub or, a, you know, something left like that. But again, I always tell people to treat each tree individually. Um, and you want to look at that tree, you know, case by case basis and not just make a, an executive decision across the board. You know, if my neighbor's trimming their trees, I need to trim mine. Um, so, you know, treat them, treat them individually. Um, take the time to look at each tree. And, and that's what I tell people is to look at each tree, shape it out how you think it needs to be shaped. And you can go in there and do some selective pruning, um, you know, throughout the year. But keep your major pruning kind of the cooler months uh, on the other side of the, the hot summer months um, just because of that fact as well. So, you know, again, trees as well. Uh, I think took a hit uh, during the cold weather, but uh, pruning step-by-step -step basis and, and very simple uh, pruning is what we're kind of suggesting at this point. Kevin, I, I can tell you're about to jump in. I just want to add one thought, and that is the reminder. I tell people not to fertilize their marginally hardy plants, which might include things like fig trees and citrus trees, and depending on where you live, um, the um, Gosh, I was trying to think of another one that falls into, oh, the cecilpinias uh, and stuff like that. Don't fertilize them after August 1st because that fertilizer is going to be around a while and you're pushing them into late season growth. So things like this December are just worse. All right. So we have a question and Stephen has uh, partially already addressed it, but I'm going to go ahead and bring it up because it is related to spring wildflowers and stuff. Alicia uh, from Grimes County says she has a sunny area where she's planted wildflowers every fall and she cannot get a good stand. She says things like blue bonnets, primrose, Indian paintbrush. Uh, she says she plants around Thanksgiving and it's sunny uh, and it's sandy most. And so she's just wanting to know if anybody has any suggestions on what she can do to, to get a good stand of wildflowers. Gosh, if I might interject really quick. Um, it really is, is dependent on the uh, species itself. I know, um, Alicia, you've indicated some plants that you're working with. Uh, some plants like blue bonnets, they need to undergo a dormancy period. So part of this is, uh, I think, um, is soil preparation, good seed to soil contact. Depending on the species itself, blue bonnets are, have a really hard seed coat. 
and they need a, a period of, of uh, weathering to get water into that seed to initiate germination. So sometimes you might uh, put out blue bonnet seed, for instance, but not get um, a good um, good result from that uh, the following year. Blue bonnet seed is pre-treated. The stuff that you, the material that you purchase from uh, an outlet uh, will should have uh, pre-treated that those seed. There is also a, um, a a bacterial association with those plants as well. Uh, now, having a uh, purchasing product that comes with an inoculated seed might enhance that as as well. But again, I really think it is a matter of the species itself. So blue bonnets in that instance, you know, you need uh, it, there has to be a weathering event that uh, allows water in there to initiate germination. So it's going to be a little bit difficult. And then there's timing of that. Typically, we say put out wildflower seed. A general caveat is put out wildflower seed around uh, uh, October, sometimes early November, you'll be more successful. So I know you've probably done all of those things, you know, to put them out at the right time. Um, so I, I think it's more related to that. So again, uh, I suggest to go ahead and prepare the area that you're working in. Sometimes that might mean clearing out a little bit more grass, creating spaces where the seed can get really good uh, contact with the with the soil itself. You might have to water if it's a little bit dry at the time that you're trying to get those seed to to germinate as well. OK, we have another question. This is from Peggy and she would like some suggestions for uh, ground covers for a rain garden in full sun and also for a rose garden. And not sure where she's located. She is uh, from my part of the world uh, here in the Beaumont area, actually. Um, anybody have any suggestions? I'm going to let you see what you guys think, and then I may add some more to it as well. Um, any suggestions on that? Um, I've got one or two, but I want to see what you guys think first. Um, kind of go from there. So I find that a lot of the sedges do well in areas that stay a little moist, and there's some a wide variety of native and, and non-native sedges that make a good ground cover. The only other thing that came to my mind is the uh, um, uh, rain lily. Uh, is it uh, citri not citrina? It's one with just like the thin little leaves. It don't. It, very narrow, almost. It'll just grow in standing water or in in a, in a creek. Um, okay. Oh my! I'll think of the name of it and add it to the chat. Okay. That's kind of what I was thinking. Maybe one of the, the lilies that that uh, we have, or um, that that's kind of what I was thinking as well for for the uh, the wetter area. Um, so I, I know the soil here in our area is kind of finicky. Uh, it's either crunchy dry or it, it's pretty damp. So there's no in between. Uh, depending on how much rainfall we get, uh, the lilies that was kind of what I was going to go for. Um, if you're looking for a uh, non-invasive ground cover for a, a full sun garden, uh, would height be an issue? Uh, that that'd be my question. Could you go something uh, that maybe gets a little taller and even still call it a ground cover, maybe like a uh, Louisiana iris or something like that? Uh, I'm just thinking because they will colonize an area and they will, you know, make almost a dense covering. Um, so that you know, that gives you some color as well. Um, just thinking on, on some of the stuff like that. So, you know, uh, maybe like a, an iris, like a Louisiana iris or a flag iris, um, and they do have some color as well. Um, Anybody else have any thoughts on a uh, non-invasive ground cover for a rose garden? Um, uh, that, David. That, that definitely had to be shorter, right? David, quickly, uh, she's put yeah. a message in there saying that it, it definitely needs to be low growing. Low growing. Okay, I see that now. Okay, well then scratch that. <laughs> um, I have to think on something like that, but um, <clears throat> okay. I'll, have to, I'll think of something and uh, we'll, we'll come up with an answer on that. That's a good question. I'd recommend mulching rather than establishing more plants underneath the uh, the roses themselves. I, I, get, I guess it depends on where the placement of that of that ground cover is, right? I wouldn't put it directly. I wouldn't let a, uh, ground covers grow directly underneath the roses. I'd rather rely on mulches to provide that service. Agreed. 
kind of kind of on the same boat. Uh, she may be looking for some color, uh, I guess, maybe in, in the off season. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of like that uh, the, the mulch. Uh, I see one that says uh, somebody posted frog fruit. Um, is frog frog fruit would be a little bit more invasive to me. Um, I'm I'm afraid that would be a little bit too aggressive. Um, and it likes to move and crawl, and it won't stay where you put it. Um, so maybe, maybe not, uh, you know, if you have time to, to work on it. But I, I'm with these other guys. I, I think a good either a, a pine bark mulch or maybe even a pine bark straw, uh, a pine straw mulch, something like that, or even a bark mulch would be probably my choice to, to you know, under roses. Um, and that would cut back and help eliminate some of your issues with uh, fungal as well when you get splashback issues on some of those roses. So if they do suffer from uh, things like black spot, um, others that would help minimize that. Won't get rid of it, but definitely minimize it. So, all right. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, we, I don't know how much rain you guys are getting up there, but it's been extremely dry here. We've had just barely over an inch of rain for the year. Uh, do you guys want to talk a moment? Uh, uh, luckily, we have rain in the forecast this week, but do you guys want to talk for a minute about some of the things that people can do uh, when we're under drought conditions to, to help their plants get through it? All right, I'll start it off um, unless somebody wants to jump in there. Um, first and foremost, uh, mulch your plants. I mean, my gosh, uh, we talk about it for weed control. But from a standpoint on uh, drought, not necessarily drought control, but for moisture consistency, mulch those plants, uh, three or four inches, depending on what you're using. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we like to use pine straw here, pine bark. Uh, if you're using a shredded bark material, a absolutely. Um, multiple benefits, uh, mulch those darn plants, put them in the ground, uh, water them, get that soil moist, uh, and definitely go that direction. Um, I think that's an easy homeowner task, mulching. Uh, you know, we mulch just about everything we can get our hands on uh, within reason, uh, just to keep that soil temperature consistent. Um, I think it will drop the temperature minimally. Uh, you know, it'll keep that soil from heating up too fast. So uh, if it is, the soil is gonna, is gonna get warmer, uh, that mulch will help to regulate it. And so that, that's what I see the benefit of uh, mulching here. Um, so I'm, I'm a big advocate of mulching, uh, no matter what you have. Um, we're actually, you know, like I said, we use a lot of pine straw, pine bark. Um, we're actually going to start playing with some uh, rice holes. Believe it or not, we're going to do some uh, rice holes as one of our byproducts here that we have access to. So we're going to see how those work. But uh, really, anything that you have locally uh, sourced does a good job, I think. Any other suggestions uh, for, I guess, uh, Drought is what was that? Was that the question? Oh, I was just wanting to wanting them to address a little bit about uh, how they what's the best way to get your plants through a, a long extended drought. One of the other uh, myths, I think, is that people believe not everyone, but some people believe that large trees have the ca capacity of reaching down and getting into the water without having any issues. Uh, can somebody talk about? the proper way to water large trees during a drought period and also how much you should water them and how often? Well, deeply and infrequently. Um, people think when they water they lo their lawn, they typically don't water deeply and frequently for the lawn, much less the trees benefiting from that. Yeah. And remember, those trees have root systems that go like two and a half times the height of the tree in all directions. So you're not keeping it alive with your watering hose. You're occasionally rescuing it when nature throws. This summer, we had 45 days over 100 degrees with no rain. OK, that's the time to water a tree for sure. Yeah. Mouth to mouth. If it comes out of the hose, it's mouth to mouth. <laughs> Another thing, um, a question that we've run into this year is that uh, with the freezes and the and the grass, um, it's given the seeds that are there the opportunity to sprout up and and really uh, pop up into the lawns. Michael, can you talk about uh, 
maybe uh, some things that people should think about doing so that when uh, grass goes dormant that they don't have all these weed seeds coming up everywhere? Yeah, um, that's and typically right now that's when we see the most influx of weeds and we get a lot of questions of lawn weed issues. So, you know, we don't look at putting pre-emergence down at this time of year. We want to get those pre-emergence out prior to those weeds actually germinating and coming out of the uh, emerging out of the soil. Um, a lot of our weeds are temperature based, uh, soil temperature based. So a lot of the weeds are anywhere in that 55, 60 degree mark uh, when soil temperatures reach that area that they start to uh, germinate uh, as far as the the winter and spring type weeds. So we've got to do a better job about, you know, when we apply those pre-emergence. Uh, one of the things that can be done besides applying pre-emergence is just mow your lawn more often. Uh, a lot of times that we, we can do that and it'll reduce a lot of the seed heads and the spreading of those weeds over time and it'll give that grass a chance to really strengthen and choke out those weeds. So rather than spraying, you know, putting out pre-emergence and stuff like that, or even post-emerge products. All right, uh, we have a question in the chat from Victoria. She's in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. She says she gets lots of fungus on things like hydrangeas, tractor seats, hostas, flocks, zinnias etc uh, she's tried neem oil she's tried baking soda spray she's tried fungicides uh, she, she wants to know if anybody has any suggestions on things that she can do to control the fungus a lot of times that's due to lack of air movement you have moist environments that continue to trap moisture uh, you know so that moisture sits there for a period of time especially in our our environment where we get 48 to 52 inches of rainfall a year. So with that moist environment, what we need to do is make sure we have enough airflow. That may mean trimming some of those plants to allow for some airflow or, um, you know, sometimes the uh, fungicides. A lot of times we put on fungicides when it's too late. We need to kind of be ahead of the game. Fungicides are typically preventative, not curative. So that's one of the, the biggest issues with applying fungicides on stuff is we tend to do it too late once we've already seen the symptoms. So we got to do a better job sometimes of looking ahead of the game and saying, OK, uh, kind of like turf grasses, you know, when the first cold front of the fall comes through and temperatures drop into the 60s, I need to have already applied a fungicide so I don't get large patch. So we kind of have to be ahead of those things sometimes in order to uh, alleviate the issues. I think it's also important to note, Michael, that uh, with those plants that, that that you know are subject to getting fungus pretty easily, uh, you should be trying to w bottom water them so that the leaves mm -hmm. are not getting wet. Exactly. All right, we have a we have a follow up question uh, to on grass. It says, uh, Michael, how long after the forecasted gully washer should I wait <laughs> until I fer fertilize? Yeah, wait till you have at least you know two to three days of no rainfall. Uh, and it also depends on what kind of fertilizer you're using. If you're using a slow release type fertilizer, you know, right after we get a rain and you got one or two, maybe three days of uh, dry dryness, you can you can basically take advantage of the moisture that's already on the ground by applying that fertilizer and it'll slowly start to uh, to, you know, exude into the soil and, and allow those root systems to uh, go ahead and take it up and and looking at temperatures, our soil temperatures and everything else, that's our turf grasses have started to grow. Um, they're not completely 100% active right now, but they're right on the verge of it. So probably in the next couple of weeks, we'll start to really see where people are going to have to start mowing twice a week. All right. So here is a question about how often you should fertilize uh, large trees. Said the uh, Anne says that she planted two large trees about two years ago, and she wants to encourage growth uh, and not shallow roots. So, who can give her advice on that? I think number one was make sure you water deeply and less often. Um, most of the time, my take is always if you're fertilizing your lawn, you're kind of fertilizing your tree. Just adding something to that, uh, when a tree's young, you want it to grow as fast as possible, but you use the word large in there. Once a tree gets pretty close to the size you want, you'd kind of like it to stop growing. 
uh, because <laughs> it just shades out your grass more and more and more and you can't grow flowers under it. And so I would say the first five years, you might stretch it to 10 fertilizing for a tree's benefit, but I wouldn't go beyond that. I guess there's exceptions to that. One. And at what time should they fertilize, Skip? I, I don't How think often? that yeah, I don't think that matters a lot. I, spring is a good time. The trees are putting on the, most of their growth in spring. They do, they grow a little bit in fall to, and through the summer, of course, but maybe spring. She says, would you suggest fertilizing every month? No. No. I think maybe. I'm going to go back to a statement I made earlier. I think we need to get out of the concept that our plants only get the water we give them and they only get the fertilizer we give them. Your soil is a bank account of a lot of nutrients. And the idea that you're regularly fertilizing a tree, even a tomato plant for that matter, I mean, it doesn't have to be fertilized every week. You know, it, there, you build your soil, you've got the bank account. All right, we have the question, uh, what is considered deep watering and how how long should you water to get, to get deep watering? And can uh, maybe, Michael, this, as very relatable to turf grass when we're trying to get turf grass deep watered. Uh, can you address maybe uh, the methods that you yeah. would suggest for doing that? It, a lot of it depends upon soil. If you have a sandier type soil, it, sandy soil, the water tends to infiltrate down pretty far. Um, and, and so you'll, you know, you'll have to water a little bit more often, especially on a sandy soil. One of the, um, cool little videos was put out by the Forest Service years ago about how to tell if you're getting adequate water down low enough. And they basically, you know, slowly water the area to an extent where you can take a screwdriver and push it down into the ground. Well, that works real great, real good with uh, clay type soils. <clears throat> and that lets you know that you are getting moisture down deep enough. Uh, typically uh, with lawns, one inch of water per week is sufficient. Uh, and you should apply that in one or two watering events, typically two watering events if you're on a clay type soil. Sandy type soils, you may have to break it up and, and do three watering events just to make sure there's adequate moisture down below. But like I said, it really depends on the soil because sometimes I've seen soils where they're, you know, 10, 12, 14 inches of sand and water goes through it pretty quick <laughs> and it's it gets dried out really fast. So it becomes real dusty. So you got to be very cognizant of that. And how deep are we trying to get the water down to? And is it different for, for different plants? Different for different plants. I think, you know, most of the time what we're trying to do is we're trying to get moisture down with turf grasses, you know, six, eight, 10 inches down. Um, that That's adequate. Um, yeah, a lot of people say, you know, I water every other day. Well, if you water every other day, you're training your turf grass to have shallow root systems, which defeats the purpose of having a drought resistant turf grass. So what you want is you want root systems that go down and find the moisture down deeper in the soil column. So good steady watering, uh, large dropules, making sure you know, you're not having like a misting situation, water in, you know, early in the mornings rather than, you know, during the middle of the night, you want to keep moisture off the leaves, reduce fungal issues. Uh, by watering in the morning and letting it burn off during the morning hours. Anybody else have any comments? Hmm. One good thing to, to throw in there on watering is to remember the adage that you want to water deeply and infrequently and not the opposite. Most of us, you know, homeowners yeah. that I deal with, it's, you know, they think of watering it in times of, of minutes and it's not really minutes like you said, it's more <laughs> of how much uh, volume that you're putting out so again michael i'm gonna throw it back to you but i, I know yeah. you was this well uh don't measure your volume in in minutes but measure it in the quantity so yeah. if you real simple do the catch can test if you guys know yep. what that is uh the little catch cans that you can buy them or you can use uh, little shallow dishes and place those strategically across your lawn and know exactly how much water you're putting out you may have a defective sprinkler head that's putting out no water and you may have an overactive sprinkler head next to it that's putting out double the amount of water so you do have to know how much water you're putting out in which location so again yeah. it's not a one size fits all category but to measure that volume in uh, quantity of water and not minutes of water um, that's what I, I, I try to stress to a lot of folks in my yeah. area 
uh, as well. So, uh, you know, I can't remember the other half the same, but it's deeply and infrequently and not, um, I forgot the other half. Uh, somebody knows it. But, um, yeah, not uh, frequently. And there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. yeah, there you go. We um, had, the, absolutely. go ahead, Skip. Oh, no, sorry. No, if you were talking about this, please go ahead. I'm, I'm <laughs> way behind. <laughs> <laughs> we have. Uh, you know, I, I dealt with a, an engineer here a few years back, and that was one of the things, you know, how many minutes do I need to put on my timer? And then I gave him the opportunity to do an irrigation audit. Uh, once he did that, he had it down to the exact minute. So um, <laughs> taught him how to do it. You know, now he knows exactly because a lot of times we get those phone calls, ex extension agents, you know, how many minutes do I need to apply water for? Well, that's a di that's different in every situation. Depends on what time of the morning, what the pressure is at that time, how many heads are in that station. So there's so many different variables that that need to be taken into consideration. So doing an irrigation audit is an extreme must. That way, you know exactly how much water you're applying. Just a just a quick comment back on the tree fertilizing. <laughs> um, if you will keep the grass away from your trees, you will do more good. For them than anything you can do for them uh, <laughs> in the forest they drop leaves to kill grass and create compost and uh, mm -hmm. the wider the area you mulch around a young tree the faster it'll grow i saw a pecan orchard one time and it was put in a bermuda field and half the field they killed the, the grass before they planted the other half they didn't five years later it was over twice as big the trees that weren't competing with grass mm -hmm. and so that's probably the most important thing you do. If you do want to fertilize, one thing I tell folks is to use your thumb. Uh, one or two cups per inch of trunk diameter. So just take your thumb. Here's my, my uh, Coke can about three inches across or so. That would be three to six cups of just lawn fertilizer, no weed and feed. Yeah. Yeah, and spread it, Michael's. Right. Yeah, spread around it. the whole root ball. Don't dump it at the bottom. Don't put it yeah. in a circle. Put it throughout a circle. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. I just... My brain kind of moves slow. Well, I okay. think even a follow up to that. What do y'all think of tree spikes? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, <clears throat> no offense, but uh, targeted distribution. <laughs> well, you're spending a lot of money on a very small targeted area, um, you know, and so do the granular fertilizer because you can cover a bigger area. And the fact that it's a lot cheaper. And if you guys have bought fertilizer, you know as well as I do, it's not cheap anymore. So um, <laughs> you're going to pay quite a bit more for that little spike um, and it's only going to reach a certain little targeted area. But uh, like you said, the broadcast around the, the base of the tree and out, uh, you know, is probably the ideal way to go on all your trees. You know, I think just making sure that there's plenty of organic matter available to that tree goes a long way. I was going to bring something up while we were talking about the, the watering. Uh, we're under stage one water restrictions down here. We have been for almost two years and, and the people are not happy that we're under stage one water restrictions. But what makes me chuckle about it is that watering only on your trash day once a week is actually the proper way to water. So I don't understand <laughs> why they're so upset about it. Uh, Skip, something that you brought up, can you t talk about why maybe we don't want to use weed and feed here? Good point. Because especially in the spring, not as much in the fall, but the time to weed is not the time to feed. You're, you're putting your weed control in College Station down in mid to late February uh, and in Houston area, probably early February to get ahead of all the warm season weeds. Depends on, yeah, anyway. Uh, you're not fertilizing until you've mowed twice, which is probably early April. Uh, and so you're, it's a waste. Um, the other reason is it's like going to the doctor and saying, I don't feel good. And he writes a prescription from that information and says, here's medicine. What are your weeds? Are they grassy weeds? Are they broadleaf weeds? Are they perennial weeds? Are they annual weeds? Uh, you know, Virginia buttonweed, Michael can comment on this, but that's a hard one to kill. And you don't just grab any weed and feed to kill Virginia buttonweed. And so I would rather fertilize when it's time to fertilize with the right product according to a soil test and do weed control when it's time to do weed control with either pre-emergent or post-emergent, but the right product at the right time. And uh, weed and feed is all, can also be toxic to your trees and shrubs. Is, is that correct? That is correct. 
And one of the issues, because we're also close to the to the water and to <laughs> lakes and streams, is that it, if that yeah. weed portion of that runs off into the stormwater system, uh, it can be toxic to uh, aquatic life. Right. Well, well even, nobody wants to follow the label. If a teaspoon's good, a tablespoon is right. better, right? Yeah, even from the standpoint too of over fertilizing or fertilizing right before a large rain and you get all that nitrogen and you get all that runoff and it goes into the bays and estuaries and streams and then you have big algal, algal blooms that occur in the, the bays and estuaries, which is a big issue for fish. When I was in Conroe, I saw a lawn they weed and feed it across the lawn and they got to the end, they had extra, so they came back double rating it and they stopped right under a tree. You could draw a line through that tree visually as to where it had herbicide damage and where it didn't. And it was the difference Ouch. between the right rate and yep. double rate. Right. Right. If you're going to fertilize, fertilize. If you're going to treat weeds, treat weeds. All right. We have a question in the chat uh, it's from Peggy. She says she has a three year old apple tree that has not flowered yet this year and wants to know if that's normal and wants to know if anyone has any suggestions. What area? Southeast Texas, where? My area. Uh, oh, your area? Yep. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> We're on the roller coaster. <laughs> we are. We are. Um, I, I guess, number one, I want to know what type of variety of apple that was planted. I um, yeah. always like to know what I'm dealing with. Um, yeah. So, could be that it, it maybe is not the right apple for this area. Um, I'm pretty sure it probably is. Um, Location I might have an issue to deal with planting uh, if it hadn't bloomed or hadn't flowered yet. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, anybody else have any thoughts? Those, those are my top two, two thoughts. Yeah, uh, too much, too much, um, too much water potentially uh, on the wrong soil. Yeah, she says it's an Einsheimer, which yeah. actually is a good variety for our area. So that's kind of what I was thinking. And uh, typically three to five years for production, isn't it? About right. Um, no, normally, I tell people the first three years, uh, <laughs> you know, if you do get a fruit, it's going to be very small, minuscule, um, and you're losing growth. So just, you know, and I hate to tell, but uh, the first three to one to three, maybe four years, knock it off, uh, take it off because you're, you're taking away from your tree production um, and you're, you're really wanting fruit at that early age. Because if it is, you're only going to get minimal fruit. It's not going to be as a better quality one that is a, a more mature tree that can handle it um as far as and she said it wasn't blooming um any thoughts on why it wouldn't be blooming at this point in time um i think it's I purely I environmental this year i'm sorry Stephen. go ahead uh, i i just think it's the age of the tree itself they may experience a sporadic flowering annually until it gets a little bit of growth to it and you know like we've all been discussing it could be environmental as well so just patience on that tree okay i, I didn't follow chill hours this, this winter but i've had more than one person call me and they everything from a dorset golden to uh, a fuji apple just not coming out and dorset golden should be out uh there okay. a few a few leaves at the end like when it doesn't get enough chilling you know the branch is naked of leaves and the end has some I don't know what to say about that. I, it, I wonder if it, you know, back to what we were talking about regular trees, you know, that December freeze had something to do with it. Very well could have. Uh, that's a good point. Um, I know in my area I had some trees starting to bloom in early, earlier than normal. How about that? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And the cold little snap that we had may have kind of confused it, I guess is a good word. Um, that would be kind of my thoughts again without looking at it, but um, you know, something that we, we can definitely kind of go from there. But uh, possibility a combination of things is what I'm suspecting. Um, you know, young age and then maybe the, the weather, and of course, you know, Skip, you mentioned the chill hours. Uh, that might be what I would uh, kind of start with the looking for an answer on something like that. And uh, guys, does she need more than one apple tree to? to be successful yes and can you guys recommend uh, uh companion varieties or should she just plant another unshimer in you know, she says she has an anna as well um so those should cross the the anna and the einshimer 
Uh, the other one that would probably cross in, in our Southeast Texas area would probably be the, uh, was it the Braeburn? Um, I think we can do a Braeburn down here. Um, and, and those, but those should cross, um, very much. So. All right. Our very good. Pairing here is Anna and or set golden. And I think those are probably good suggestions for the entire coast. So. Um, going back to the, the freeze, uh, the freeze caused the freeze two years ago caused some really strange things to happen. I mean, um, we were talking about live oaks earlier and what we saw with live oaks down here was uh, initially a bronzing. Did that occur where you guys were at as well? And then um, so they did one leaf replacement cycle and then uh, did another leaf replacement cycle. So they went through a double leaf replacement cycle in our area, which is very stressful on the trees. All right. Um, I, I saw that the new Texas Superstar catalogs came out. I, we all got about a, a bunch of them. They mailed them to us. Uh, are there any plants in the new Texas Superstar catalog that you guys are excited about? All of I wish, them. I wish I had it in front of me. So I, I have the link. Would you like for me to put the link in the chat? Hey, yeah, that'd be good for everybody. Thank you. Absolutely. OK. There it is. <laughs> Call your county extension office. They may have some copies of that. Yeah, just might. <laughs> I, I did receive that. I gave a presentation last week at a local library and offered that. Um, the new brochure, it, it's it's a great publication, great information, but I don't believe that there's a, a newer introductions within that catalog, but it is definitely worth, a, worth getting a copy. It's an outstanding program. Yeah, it, very, it sure is. All right, uh, you guys want to talk anything about uh, vegetable gardening? Any tips, any things that people should know about um, what they should be planting right now? Um, I'll go ahead and jump in on that if we want to. Um, I'm going to cross my fingers and hopefully everybody's got their tomatoes at least maybe in the ground. Uh, the earlier the better. Uh, we always preach that. You know, I have some folks that may try to start in February. Um, maybe not a good year this year to get it started quite as early, but uh, the earlier the better on tomatoes. Uh, and all we're doing there is trying to beat the heat and the bugs. And you guys know that. Um, so hopefully you, you've got your early, what I call early to mid-season vegetables in, tomatoes and things like that. Um, if you're looking at some of the planting guides uh, that we produce and put out, um, you're going to start seeing some warmer season things that can be put out. Um, you know, peas, uh, some of your beans, things like that can definitely start going in the ground. Um, we haven't started doing ours yet, but we're getting very close. Um, Corn can also be started uh, if you're going to do some rows of corn in your garden as well. And then, of course, our, our warm weather things like uh, okra. Uh, I haven't put out okra yet. Uh, I'm kind of waiting to see what the weather's going to do. But, uh, you know, the okra, you know, loves the heat. So uh, kind of just plan accordingly. Um, but you, you should have, go ahead, like I said, your tomatoes and, you know, younger stuff. Uh, cucumbers, uh, things like that should probably hopefully be in the ground. If not, uh, pretty quick to get them started and get them established before the heat kicks in. Um, I think we're going to be looking at a very dry summer, looks like, uh, in my area especially. So, um, you know, it might help to uh, think about, you know, doing some supplemental irrigation on that garden as well as needed um, when it does get dry. So. Anybody else want to comment? We have a question about tomato varieties that, that fruit in hot temperatures, of, they said above 85 degrees, but uh, anybody know of tomato varieties that are recommended for the heat? Uh, some of your older varieties uh, do really well in the heat in the warmer weather. Uh, heat Master, if you can find it, maybe Homestead is an older variety that I think does fairly well. Uh, there are a couple of varieties that I think we had last year that did okay. Uh, during the summertime. Now, of course, that's with supplemental irrigation, uh, and we mulched ours pretty heavily as well. Um, you know, it all just depends on how hot, how quick the, the weather gets. But uh, 
look for some of those uh, varieties that maybe are coming out of Florida. Uh, I think we've had decent luck with those. Uh, Heatmaster, again, Homestead did okay. Um, you know, things like that's what I would look for that would tolerate the heat. In, I think Tycoon general, is recommended also. Tycoon's a great tomato. Sorry, I don't, oh, I don't know much about its heat tolerance, but it's a great tomato. Uh, okay. In general, the cherry types and the grape types are going to set fruit much better in the heat than the slicer types. Correct. And can somebody talk about why tomatoes stop setting fruit? Is it? So, so whenever nighttime temperatures are up into the upper 70s or mid mid 70s even to upper and the daytimes are above 90, the pollen, something about the pollen uh, moving down into the flower, which it's a self-pollinated flower when it shakes, uh, and the, the germination of the pollen tube successfully creating seeds, uh, that starts to break down. I don't know the technical whys of that, but. All right, uh, Peggy asked, uh, can you grow cucumbers in a container and uh, maybe m make some suggestions of, of what varieties you should be using for a container? Um, I'm open for suggestions. Uh, we, we played with several different varieties, uh, but I would say absolutely yes. That's probably one that you can definitely grow in a, a decent sized container if you're space limited. Um, and then you can, of course, if you want to try to trellis them up and, uh, you know, keep them off of the ground, that would be the best option. Um, anybody have variety su suggestions that y'all have tried that, that work well? There are bush types out there, but I, I just use whatever variety is the best quality, in my opinion, kind of thing, and then put a trellis in the container. You can put a little ring. It needs to be a good sized container. By the way, anybody watching gardening shows on TV that aren't from Texas, uh, when you see containers, move the size up two containers larger because it's hotter longer. And unless you want to water it twice a day, uh, you need a big size container, which is big enough for compute for cucumbers to put a little cage in. Um, yeah, that even if your plant survives, you know, you forget to water your tomato and you come back and it, it's wilted and you water it and it bounces back and you think, ah, I survived it. Well, what you did is abort all the flowers and just set your production down to way low. All right, very good. Um, we have a question about blackberries. Uh, Christy would like to know what causes blackberry leaves to yellow. It, is, it, it, is it older leaves or younger leaves, Christy? Yeah. If you can put that in, that would help us. Younger it could be it could be iron deficiency, uh, heavy clay soils, high pH soils, black new leaves. leaves. Yeah, new she growth. says it's new leaves. Yeah, that that was would be what I say said. Uh, I think it is. So m most likely some sort of oh, deficiency. So. Yeah, it could be a deficiency of some sort. That would be possibly iron. So maybe just applying some chelated iron uh, to start off with and, and see if she gets a good response from that. And then I would also recommend uh, lots of organic matter since it's uh, sandy soil. And no herbicides around them in the soil. There are some herbicides that can turn the new growth yellow or white, whitish. All right. And Osmocote is fine. Um, so we have a question about how to control uh, Forest tent moth caterpillars. And I don't know if I know the answer to that, so. I, I'll weigh in, I guess. I, I, they, they hatch out, they form a little herd on the trunk, and then they go up and create the webbing and the V-shaped connections in the branches. So you got, if you, if you spray BT on the leaves, you, you will kill them. You just have to do that about every three to five days because it breaks down so fast. But one just kind of strange thought about it, uh, if any of you have never read the book, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy, the book is all about the effects of us bringing in plants that get absolutely no caterpillars on them. You know, all our 
ligustrums, red tips, just all these plants from somewhere in Asia that we that dominate our landscapes uh, don't provide for the birds. And oak trees and other kinds of trees provide those caterpillars. Uh, boy, I sound like an environmental advocate, but I'm going to keep going. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the birds when they're nesting now, all the songbirds we feed to bring them in, they need protein and uh, you know that protein and oil content for their babies to eat. And that's caterpillars, unless you want to buy dried mealworms to put in your feeder. Uh, and so this is a critical time for them to have caterpillars. So I would assess, I've not on my trees ever seen Eastern tent caterpillar become a major problem. I know they can, uh, but a few caterpillars here and there is, I would just say a good thing overall. Hey, we have a question from Peggy. Uh, about controlling leaf rollers on her cannas. And I'm just going to start off by saying initially when I moved here to Corpus, I, I was not happy that, that I had leaf rollers on the cannas until I figured out what butterflies they turned into. And then I decided, OK, they can have the cannas and I'll just cut them back after they're done with them. What are you guys thoughts on that? Same. Got to plant some for the wildlife too. <laughs> and cannas are so vigorous, I don't think it does much damage to them. It does make them ugly for a little while, but uh, but the caterpillars uh, turn into beautiful butterflies. So I, after I figured that out, I was like, no, they can they can feed on the cannas. It'll be fine. I'm trying to find a link. I'll post it about cannas and and leaf rollers if I can find it. Yeah, I took a video of them in my yard and put it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to post it. Tell me if this works, but it's just showing the canna leaf roller, what it looks like inside the leaf. Uh, and I, part of the video, too, is wasps. Um, wasps are their number one enemy. And so here we go. Somebody tell me if that works when it pops up. Uh, part of the video is I was cruising around through my cannas, taking video, and I saw this wasp chewing up the remains of a caterpillar, and they were zooming all around looking for those things. Just another reason, caterpillars are the number one food of all the paper wasps that, in general, we try to avoid, but they're part of the balance of nature. Okay, Christy would like to know, is there anything she can do to take care of woolly worms? Will, will BT work on woolly worms? Yeah, BT will work on any larva stage that's feeding on leaves. So that would be uh, the first thing I'd try is, is apply an application of BT. And they said your your uh, link to the video works, Skip. So. OK, we're down to just the last few minutes. Uh, anybody on the panel? Have anything else that you'd like to discuss? Anybody in the audience have any other questions for us before we uh, say goodbye today? Hey. Okay. So we are doing uh, this roundtable quarterly. Uh, and can anybody anybody have the date for the next next session? And they can sign up for it on Eventbrite. So, while my cohorts find those dates for you, I just encourage <laughs> you to tell your tell your friends and neighbors that garden. This is a, a unique opportunity. I've never been on anything online where I could pick the brains of horticulturists across the region uh, and get good research based, evidence based information. And so, uh, we only do it a few times a year, but it. It's a great opportunity. Okay, Christy says it's July the 5th. So uh, go to Eventbrite and look up gardening on the Gulf Coast and be sure and register. And uh, I believe, I believe we have new flyers and stuff to share, if I'm not mistaken. So we got those from Ginger. All right. Well, we're getting a lot of people saying thank you, and we we appreciate you guys for giving us the opportunity to provide horticulture education for you. 
we know uh, a lot of things have changed over the last few years, but uh, I, I like this round table as well. I think uh, it's a good way uh, for people to address the issues and the things that they have going on. So um, I want to thank the panel, uh, David and Michael and Skip and Stephen for being here and helping us today. And I hope that you all got have a wonderful Wednesday and uh, a very happy uh, Easter as well. Bye-bye.